I went to Dubai two days, three days after that, and a week later in Dubai, I still had the teeth marks of Dylan Hartley's teeth in my finger a week later. So like, I'm hardly going to stand on the pitch and bite my own finger and go, hold on ref. It's, you know, somebody, it was only me and Dylan Hartley on the floor, like it couldn't have been anybody else. Unless a dog fucking ran out from behind the stadium and bit me in the finger and then ran off again. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Pass Offload with the one, the only Ryan Wilson. Uh, the only one right now. No, Max, is he just coming in just in time? No, because he is late. Yeah, no, keep recording this. So it was hello and welcome to the episode with just Ryan Wilson at the moment, <laughs> is what you were going to say. Because Max is late. And he's going to, even though there was a, a newspaper article that went out about him being late for the first uh, pre-season, he's, he's late. <laughs> Pat Lamb's listening. He's late for this as well. Unbelievable. Here Unbelievable. we go. No, 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 no. I will not start off the podcast with this kind of... Oh, hello, Max. Um, you're slightly late. It, the time is 4... 14... No, oh, no, what's that? I was reading it backwards. It's 4.01, and we were due to start at 10 to 4. Um, no, no, but, but it's not I your said... Fault. We originally... It's not your fault, is it? It's not your fault, is it? But we originally said four, didn't we? Did we? No. Uh, no, nah, to be fair, we did. We did say four. Okay. Um, Where are you, by the way? You love some quaint cottage or something. Yeah, it's my old man's house. I don't know what that is. He, he'll claim he painted that himself. I've been down the beach with him all day, Max. We went down to Hailing Island, of all places on Earth. You check my Instagram out after this, you'll laugh a lot because it was... It, <laughs> I won't say what it was because you can't say that anymore, but... We went down, it was a very questionable place. We basically parked in the car park and he gets out his old deck chair, gets out his little table, gets out a hob, starts frying sausages up. Kid's like, Grandad, what are you doing? <laughs> like a proper old man now, he's got his Crocs on and we sat in this absolute shithole on the pebbliest beach on earth um, and he just cooked up a couple of sausages and poured himself three bottles of wine. So. He's well and truly on his way. I was like, I've got to get back into this podcast, Dad. Oh. Sat there snoring his head off. Like, we go down the beach to see Grandad, and he just slept the whole time. Pebbly beaches, yeah. though, those got to be the, one of the worst things ever, ever like, invented Absolutely. as a habitat. An awful place. And not only that, but he took us to a place where the tide was so brutal. It's where, like, the boats come from, <laughs> that the kids couldn't even go swimming because as soon the as they went tides. near the water, they just get swept away. I was like, watching kids try and swim in this thing. So the kids couldn't go in the water. It was pebbly. Granddad slept the whole time, and he, I'm pretty sure he undercooked the dodgy sausages. So uh, I think they were out of date as well. So, yeah, it's not quite Bézier in Barcelona. How's pre-season anyway, Max? Is it all right? <laughs> Oh, mate, yesterday was horrendous. It was, oh, no. It was in like 30 decks. We had the conditioning games. Um, I was like hallucinating. It was, it was awful. They made like the games like at least 40% harder. I was like, when will this end? And then today, oh. bro, we were swimming like anvils with heavy shopping. Mate, I'm awful. But I'm way better because of last year. But, oh. Mate, very yeah, but I, 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 I've said this before. I don't mind the swimming because you, you're not, required to be good at swimming as a rugby player so you can be shit at it and it's not your fault so you just do the old oh yeah yeah walk, that's true. you know There's the no old like... walking and paddling and you just say oh i'm sorry but it's not my job yeah, I, to be good yeah. at swimming I, I, you know i take i take your point but still you still like you're getting waterboarded by dick cheney's goddamn yeah it's, awful. it's like you're in guantanamo bay in that pool but um they've Dave Rennie put us in an Olympic swimming pool where no one could touch the bottom and made us tread water for, we didn't know how long it was and it went on for 50 minutes. And that's we had to tread water for 50 minutes and boys were cramping like, that wasn't fun. And that's where you can't pretend, do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> when people <laughs> <were> drowning. <laughs> but genuinely, boys, I swear oh. to God, Ratu Tangive, uh, Big Brian Alonese, who's down oh. at Toulon, um, <laughs> Ratu Nico. Boys were drowning left, right, and centre. And we were, and Dave's like, you better help them, mate. And you're like, what? And it's like, well, keep them afloat. So then other guys are having to keep these guys from drowning. So I should have just pretended to drown and everyone could have held me up. But, oh, mate, I don't know if I want to hear too much about your preseason because I'm starting to get the anxiety no, no. and the fear already. There's some good news, though, right? We've got new chefs. Oh, my God. 
Every mealtime is a pilgrimage of the palate, like the most ridiculous cuisine ever. Today, what did I have? I had an anisone steak with like a Caesar salad with the croutons, sourdough croutons, apparently they're good for the girls. Not really sure about that, but delicious nonetheless. Then roasted beetroots and some lovely Maris Piper potato wedges. And he makes this like wonderful um, sort of turmeric laced um, spicy hot sauce himself. And it's just wonderful, like very Nando's, he like quite peri peri. And then he does these overnight oats, which are outrageous. He's probably laced them with amphetamines or something, like highly addictive. Everyone's going into them, like coconuts. And he makes all his own nut butters and stuff, mate. And now you are hear you that about that. <laughs> oh no, mate, this is the, this is Big Mike, Big Mike Batch from Bath. He's now up. He's now under under Bristol employ. Under oh, the, is that the bloke it, that you used to harp on about at Bath? Yeah, yeah, it's oh, it's King Midas of the Bristol? kitchen, mate. Yeah, yeah, he's some boy, some boy. Oh, mate, I'm so jealous, so yeah, jealous. Yeah, no, no. yesterday, yeah, yeah, yesterday I was weighted down by a fresh mango chutney and the finest chicken curry of all time. Probably didn't help some of the boys <laughs> when we got to the field, though. Very weighty. That boy's a bit lethargic in line-up units. Very slow foot speed. <laughs> I was like, oh no. Everyone's got, everyone's got, everyone's got a rice baby and they want to pass out, but yeah. Well, we are delighted to be joined by uh, ex-Irish International and British and Irish Lions, Stephen uh, Ferris. Uh, how are things going, Stephen? Not too bad, thank you. Um, to be honest, I actually feel a little bit sick. Like, I've had three Snickers, two fish, <laughs> and about four or five coffees today and like the joys of retirement i haven't been to the gym in weeks i'm just sitting here thinking to myself like i really need to catch myself on but yeah everything's good the sun is shining i'm up in port rush here at the minute uh just up with the family for a bit uh my wife's from this part of the world so um just hanging about up here uh, there's a couple of golf competitions on i might catch over the next few days and then Obviously, watch the, the Open at the weekend in Ireland in the final test on Saturday morning. So, yeah, it's a big week. You talk as if you've only just come out, like, just retired as well. Like, you're smashing <laughs> Snickers, Snickers and Kit Kats and whatnot. It's been a while, isn't it? You're going to be in trouble if you keep going that way, mate. <laughs> oh, I've uh, fast-switched fibres. Max knows all about it. Yeah, um, yeah no, you're... you're... I've got Kev Geary lashing the whip right now. Second week of pre-season. Speaks of you very highly. Bit of a freak uh, show in the gym, weren't you, back in the day? Um, I wouldn't say that. I was just very explosive and strong, oh, yeah. um, powerful. Like, I wasn't throwing around the biggest 10 in the gym, Max, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah, just uh, very explosive. Unfortunately, I've probably compounded some of my injuries throughout the years. But, yeah, 2014, Ryan, was when I... When I uh, wrecked my wrecked myself and had to hang up the boots, so it was a long time ago. But I'm a complete sugar addict. Like you have no idea. I can't go through a day without at least maybe six or seven hundred calories of sugar. So <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, that Max wouldn't let that anywhere near his lips. Look at that chassis. That would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely raw honey only. And maple syrup. Uh, let's um, crack into some rugby after the Southern Hemisphere teams obviously dominated the first weekend of the Test matches. Northern Hemisphere sides uh, roaring back last weekend, winning all of their clashes. Bizarrely, the first time in history that Australia, New Zealand and South Africa all lost at home on the same day. Uh, Stephen, let's start with your lads making history in Dunedin, beating the, uh, the All Blacks in New Zealand for the first time ever to keep their series hopes alive. Give us a sentiment of how you watched it. Oh, it was ridiculous. Uh, I don't know what the other lads think as well, but like the first half, what did it last? 64 minutes or something in total. Um, yellow cards, red cards. I wasn't sure what the hell was going on um, with the people coming on and off the pitch. There's a few people on social media that I follow tried to give a good explanation of it. And I think there was actually a few mistakes made by, by the referees. Um, and hopefully that will iron those out going forward across world rugby but yeah Ireland credit to them they got off to a fast start once again getting that first try and you know there seems to be huge pressure on Ian Foster the New Zealand head coach like massive pressure at any time the All Blacks even have a mediocre win like they're, they're calling for his head I'm not sure if he's he's the right fit uh, his face doesn't fit maybe I'm just not sure what is what is going on there in general the boys were were, were really impressive um 
They stuck to the guns with the game plan, played a bit more rugby than they did in the first test. I saw it like this, but it was just like uh, Ireland this time were just way more clinical and New Zealand were just, yeah, with their um, with the, with the cards and et cetera, Max, and with their discipline, just sort Max, of let them down. Max, tell me this. What, so how can you go from one weekend absolutely pumped in the scrum and then they just turn it around with the same units in the pack for Ireland? And if anything, I know... Um, with the yellow cards now, a bit of oh, the one. yeah. It, but like, it, made a huge it's all in the back row, all from the back <laughs> row. <laughs> no, it, like with the scrum, I think like when you come when you come away from a game where like Ireland were on the back foot for like most of that first test, you can make sort of little technical sort of uh, tweaks and can completely change what goes on in the next by 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 a week's end. Like tight furlongs, very very technical operator all those boys porter as well very technical they just needed like a few tweaks and they were on top obviously tongue of Fassi going off early um gave them a window in and also that i think there was a massive psychological shift in terms of like the body language of the irish pack like i think they felt like they were on top and that's a massive into a thing like scrummaging as well over like an 80 minute game for sure how good was todd burn oh my god oh wow yeah man was yeah. on fire wasn't he Absolutely carving up. Like he was he was impressive. He was impressive. But those three cards, a couple of them were a bit dubious, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. See the, the red card, like I understand the whole thing about protecting players and but it was a last minute cut yeah. and it, it head and head collision. I don't think it's a red. I think it's yellow, but the ref says that he he no, put like he put more force into it. No change of angle, but a last minute tackle, they get a bit of a hick. I know they can be both sides of the coin looked at there, but I don't know. I think that wasn't a red. It could have changed the game. And then who was it? Fine guy, Knuckles won or Matt Hansen? Yeah, never. I don't, I don't even think I was a penalty. Uh, so you look at those and you're going, oh, you know, big change in the game there. So it's interesting. It's interesting to see, but. Um, Fair play to the Irish. Like they, they did get front football. They're playing like you see Leinster play, and they had that that way about them back. And um, so yeah, makes it bloody interesting though. Keeps it interesting for the last game, doesn't it? But when you boys are watching it, so I mean, to be fair, Johnny Sexton after in the post match interview was like, we were kind of on top with fifteen v fifteen. So that's the fairest bit. But when everyone, you know, professionals and just random people are looking at an event and, and, and going, right, what is supposed to be happening? Because technically, right, as far as I can tell, New Zealand should have been down to 12. Those are the rules. Yeah. And that wasn't put in place in any way, shape or form. But do you, guys, do you players ever sort of get into this situation? Is it just a freak a a occurrence? And you're like, okay, well, we don't really need to know what's supposed to happen here. Well, it, it happened in the Six Nations with Ireland against Italy. It did, yeah. So we, we, we all talked about that and went said, oh, you know, this is just a once-off. It's never going to happen again. And correct me if I'm wrong, lad, I think I've seen it maybe two or three times since that game. Mm. Um, and just with more yellow cards and red cards in the game, World Rugby have to do something about it because I do think it's unfair. Um, if you get somebody else, uh, you know, sent off, that you, you have to go down an extra man just to have a front row player on the pitch. So that's just my take on it. Yeah, straight after that Italy game, Italy Island game, everyone came out and said that that rule needs to change straight away. And then obviously nothing was done about it. So listen up, people, change the bloody rule. Did you boys realise Ardi Savea was the one who wasn't supposed to come back on? No, he was supposed to go off. No, because that, that was the weirdest thing, right? Like their best player. I'm trying, essentially, or their talent. I'm trying to work out how many beers deep I was at that point. So <laughs> it wasn't really. Nothing really made sense. <laughs> I'm still on holiday. I'm still on holiday. So um, I've got another four days left. So that's my excuse. But yeah, don't ask me any technical questions. I wasn't quite there. Okay, non-technical, but far more relevant to you, right? Peter oh, Armani no. told Sam Kane he was a shit Richie McCaw, uh, which, <laughs> which I, I'm sure he was relatively insulted by. But uh, it, right, if someone said that to you, would, would you take it... Uh, as a compliment, perhaps. Oh, yeah, put me in the same bracket. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, fuck yeah. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. That's, I wonder. I want to know what what he said back to him. But yeah, that's quite funny. You got to have stuff out on the pitch. So we always talk about it. Like, I would have loved to hear it. What did you hear it over the uh, mic or something? Ref mic. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's wow. brilliant. That's absolutely <laughs> priceless. I love it when stuff like that gets picked up. But um, no, you've got, yeah, that is a compliment. Getting put in the same bracket as Richard McCall, so I'm sure Sam Kane appreciated it. Is there a really good sledge you guys can recall from your careers where someone's got, ah, oh, fair play, that's, 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 that's hilarious. I got yellow carded once at Welford Road and I was getting, I was getting, a, we were struggling in the scrums a bit, but I got yellow carded for like taking out the nine of the breakdown. And Gen <laughs> Genji was, I was scrummaging against Genji and Genji was coming past the touchline to see me in the sin bin and like a break of play and he goes, you don't want to come on lad because you're on rollerblades out here. And then he just walked off at my whole bench. <laughs> my whole bench. <laughs> We just started like in hysterics at me. He's, he's absolutely done you there. I was like, yeah, didn't have enough time to give him a comeback because he's just disappeared <laughs> off into the play. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was good. I, I did chuckle at that, to be fair. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that sort of all black aura that everybody's grown up with. Do, do we think now, particularly the Irish, but perhaps other sides watching uh, Ireland, New Zealand at the moment, think that the all blacks have lost? Some of that aura, or we don't we don't fear them as much anymore. I think that I think that started last year, though, didn't it? Like in the championship, they just they weren't they're just not. I think we we sort of underrate the generation of players they've had previously. Almost like they were so freaky. Some of those guys, like you, I just like generational players, like in a single team that you won't see for a, a, a long while. I believe anyway. I think that's sort of, so I think it's, it's, it's tough to compare eras like that at, at just straight up because like guys like Dan Carter, um, Ma Manu, Richie McCall, like et al. Like you could name lo like tons of guys, even the, some of the guys that didn't even get to win one of those World Cups. There were just so many and it's just, it's difficult to be like straight up. I think it's a little unfair sometimes, but uh I, yeah, I just don't. It, it is what it is. I, in my in my opinion, yeah. I, I'd say, like, I, I played against Jerome Kano, and like Jerome yeah. Kano, was maybe 115 to 120 kegs, like a pure brutality. And now they're playing Papalihi, who looks what 105, 108. You know, the Kieran Reid, 112, 114 kegs, runs very fast, never takes a backward step. Uh, Artie Savea is a, a freak show of an athlete. We all know how explosive and powerful he is, but it just feels like they've, they've went away a little bit from the, the huge physicality that they used to bring the matches. Like, when I played against them, it was just, like, it was ferocious. Um, and even Richie McCaw, who, who wasn't somebody who went around banging boys, but it was what he brought to the breakdown. And I just don't think that they have that at the minute. And with Brody Retallick, uh, in the second row with Whitelock, they they don't seem to be at the peak of their powers that they were maybe six or seven years ago. Um, and a couple of those big, uh, like the Franks brothers in the front row, um, you know, Mia Lamu at Hooker. Yeah, just, yeah. See. They, they're just missing a little bit more of that physicality. Like in all the leagues around the world, it's the biggest, strongest, fittest, most powerful teams that are winning everything these days. Um, and maybe that's what they got to revert back to just, just a little bit. With that in mind, do we think that Foster should go as the Kiwi media seem to be calling him to do? Well, Mark, all the chat is obviously here in Ireland that because Joe Smith has been hanging around, obviously with the Blues, done very well all season. Then he sort of stepped into Foster's boots during when he had the, the, the bit of a uh, COVID scare or whatever it was. He, there was chat that he wasn't going to be at the first test and, all of, and then all of a sudden he was there um, doing all the interviews and everything else. So I think because of all the success that Joe Smith had with Ireland, that the Kiwis are like, why are we not employing this guy? Why, you know, if he can do this with the Irish players and we feel that we have a better quality of players, then what could he do for us? Uh, and that's just the, the opinions that are floating around here at home. Um, but yeah, on the ground, I heard from Alan Quinlan, um, through a friend of mine in the commentary side for Sky at the minute. He says like, you know, it's like somebody's died over there this week just because, you know, New Zealand got uh, their asses handed to them by Ireland. So it'll be interesting to see what the reaction is with is this week. And, you know, very interesting to hear Ian Foster's pre-match and post-match interviews, especially if it doesn't go to plan. 
Yeah, that'll be the telling point, won't it? This next game, if they go out there, and you will see a backlash from them, you'll see them, they'll get their tails up. And I know we said it last week, Max, and I'll say it again, I don't think there's a chance that Ireland will win next week. I think they'll go out there and I reckon the, <laughs> the All Blacks. <laughs> wow. <Okay. laughs> but even more so, even more so because of that. And then that'll be the telling point. I think you'll start to ask questions, but we're too close to a World Cup to go getting rid of the coach and and start employing someone in, I reckon, with, with those boys. Do you not think? Is that not a bit close to a World Cup to start sacking a coach and bring someone in? Or do you think they need to because of that? I'm not too sure. Like, uh, you... I think with, with somebody like Joe Smith, who's been in the camp already, it wouldn't yeah. be a big loss just to you know, cut somebody loose and just kick on. Um, like If it doesn't go to plan this weekend, I think the All Blacks, arguably the best side in the world, not, um, and they're not producing at home um, when they're all supposed to be fresh and they're all supposed to be, um, you know, rocking and rolling, I, I think there could be a big decision made, but I don't think they're going to lose. And, uh, you know, that's why I think probably Ian Foster will, will probably keep his job until the world, until after the World Cup. Patriotic prediction there from you, Stephen. Now, let's, let's get your actual predictions. Let's start with you. <laughs> let's start with you, Stephen. So, are you going for a, a New Zealand win? Yeah, I... Uh, now that I'm retired as well, I also follow the bookmakers, so I tend to uh, <laughs> I tend to look at spreads of a, of, of a lot of the games, um, and it's always very tight. So, yeah, I think it's nine points, ten points this weekend in, in New Zealand's favour, and I think it'll probably be around that. That's that's me just being honest. I, I think we've seen it before with you know the, the lads have played in teams when you get such a big win, you create history. You know all the the hype that comes with it. Um, the adrenaline that comes with that, you know, the boys will be patting themselves in the backs all Monday, Tuesday. You can maybe take your eye off the ball a little bit, um, you know, just go through the motions a little bit, during, you know, during the match week, thinking that everything's going to be very similar when you take the pitch again on the, on the, on the Saturday. Um, I totally agree with Ryan. It's not going to be the same. Like, it's, it's just not going to be the same. Um, I think the intensity of the All Blacks are going to bring is just going to be on a, on, a, on a different level. It has to be. So, yeah, I think I'm going to go for an All Blacks win, but, for Ireland to go out there, get a test result uh, and beat the Mario All Blacks winning two out of the five. I, I would have probably taken that four weeks ago before the lads, you know, took off from Dublin. Yeah, I've said it already. I reckon All Blacks, All Blacks, they have a bit of a backlash. They'll be uh, raring to go and I can't see Ireland doing it. So, I'll go, I'll go All Blacks by 10. Max Olaf Heath? I'll go, I'll go Ireland by three. I just think they look... I think in the phase play with the ball in hand, they just look more organised, more useful. Like I just think they know what they're about. Now they've got that kind of win in them. I think, yeah, they'll go on and get it done. I think so. They've got like enough experience in those like those big leaders just to, yeah, I think they're going to get it done for sure. Okay, great. Let's um, move on to England, Australia. England following in the Irish footsteps, putting in a much improved performance in that second test and weathering that second half storm from the Aussies to clinch a 25-17 victory. Uh, Max is the resident Englishman. How did we feel about that performance? Yeah, it was good, wasn't it? It was like first half, absolutely suffocated Australia. Uh, the likes of like Courtney Laws, um, Owen Farrell, uh, Billy Vunapol, like the boys were playing out of their skins, especially for that first half. Uh, I just think that like breakdown, England's breakdown was just so good and they were forcing so many errors. Like Australia definitely were a little bit sloppy there. Like there were a few silly penalties. Um, and they got a bit shy. Not many ball carriers were really presenting themselves in that first half. Like everything they did was just getting put backwards. Uh, Nick White was having a nightmare at the breakdown, just slow ball. Uh, and Australia just battled in general. And then second half, it sort of um, kicked on and Australia got a few, a few sort of, sort of moments in the game. Momentum shifted a bit, but I think England just had did enough um, to get it done in the end. Like, just kept on top of them. Yeah, I thought I thought the Aussies were going to pull it back, though. Like, when they got to within five points, <clears> I was like, oh, here we go. This is them coming back again. And I thought they were going to do it. Yeah, when um, when Bright did made that break, I was like, oh, it's going to do it. Yeah, and then, uh, and then it, it was sort of flitted out. But I don't know. I thought, I just... To me, the Aussies went... killed themselves, didn't they? They yeah, killed themselves right. with the first half, like Owen Farrell knocking over them penalties. They killed themselves in the first half, and they'll be kicking themselves for that. 
It'll be absolutely raging. But it's um, who's uh, did I see a Toje and Underhill oh, out? So that'll be an interesting one with a Toje out. Who comes in for him? It's it's a worrying one for Underhill, uh, isn't it? Sam Underhill. Like he's had a number of concussions. Yeah, he's had a lot. Caught, of concussions. caught up with them there at the Six Nations when Ireland played against England um, over there and having, having a chat like him, you know, he got asked about his concussions and he's had a bit of a rough time and the last the last thing you want to see is somebody at the end of the season getting another bang to the head. So hopefully uh, he recuperates over the pre-season and we can see him back fit and healthy next year because he's a bloody good player. Like he's, you know, you talk about physicality and somebody's going to go around chopping people all day when, when he's on it. Like uh, he certainly helps England. An interesting article uh, interview with Nick White. Obviously, he's been on the show before, and we, we all love him. But he was saying that he thought that the English had a game plan to get under the skin uh, of the Aussies, which is almost quite ironic. You always feel like the Aussies are the, the home of sledging, if you will. Uh, what, what, what do we think of his comments? Yeah, I sort of saw that a bit. To be fair, like every break in the play, there was like hands on, like heads, ruffling hair. Um, and then Australia, obviously as a test team, are a lot more inexperienced over the board, especially in the pack. So, like, that England team was set out and just to bully them. And they, they did in that first half, for sure. That's what, that's what it looked like to me. But you could see it, yeah. That was... Well, you could see it from the first game with Johnny Hill, like we spoke about last yeah. week. He'd been sent in there to just wind them up, just get under right. their skin. And they, they were doing it again this week, weren't they? I'll tell you what's bloody interesting. How much they use Big Angus Bell off of their like, line of side plays and stuff. And he's, like, he's become a league carrier. player. Because <laughs> he was at the bar bars, and he, when everyone started going down, the big Dwayne Vermeulen was down. It was like, when's I've played eight before? <laughs> he was like, when he was like, when I was like under sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> Renz was like, right, okay, so we've got ourselves a number eight. He genuinely, like, he went with it. it. Was like, Belly, you're gonna play number eight. Big Belly's at eight. <laughs> and so I know that he could play a little bit, but they love him off strike plays, eh? Yeah, so good to see. Well, Ryan, like. You obviously like to get under people's skin or like, you know, have a bit of sledge and a bit of crack on the pitch. Was that a tactic that you used in the URC semi-final when you get beaten by 70 against Leinster? No, not that one. Not that one. That well, was, hold on, uh, hold on a that second. That one had gone too far. You, you were fighting, <laughs> sorry, shirt grabbing in the first couple of minutes. You had a couple of boys pinned to the ground, giving it stacks, and it sort of didn't happen for you, did it? <laughs> yeah, well, someone had to try at the beginning, didn't they? But once it went too far, it went too far. <laughs> So that you can't like first twenty minutes you can go hell for leather, but then when you start to spill the swing of the game and you know the swing of that game, yeah, Albert, he's back here. This isn't working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <I'd> say so. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus! But now nah, it's um the English are definitely up to it. They're 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 winding people up, and the Aussies can lose their heads, can't they? So, but then again, it can go the other way. But it's when a team's on top, and you can see that. Like, the way that England were in top in the first half, that's where it's all coming. That's where all the heat's coming. And that's where people are getting wound up. They're giving away stupid penalties. Just a little ruffle of the head saying, oh, well, I'm yeah, mate yeah. slapping the arms. Yeah. You know, yeah. the driving more when you're, you're coming over, you give them a bit of a push to let them know we scored. Uh, you're like, yeah, just dominate your lad. Get back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hand in the wrong, the wrong place. Yeah. Getting up. But no. I don't know what you're talking about, by the way, Stephen, in that, in that Lynx game. I was uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we're up to. Just I think it was the, excuses. <laughs> I, I was in commentary with uh, John Barkley, and he was just sitting beside me, going, "I bet you everything that I own that that's Ryan Wilson at the bottom of that rocky game." And I was like, and then all of a sudden, you the bodies would get up, and there's you just like grabbing on to somebody at the bottom of the rock, and then like three three minutes later, oh, there's another scuffle off the ball. And John would just turn around and bet you any money it's Ryan Wilson at the bottom of that break time. <laughs> yeah, they pick on me, mate. Time. They pick on me. What do you want me to do? They're, they're bullying me. <laughs> Stephen, in your career, did you ever sort of go into a match knowing that an opposition player like could be potentially targeted with, you know, chat or, or, or a bit of handbags or something along those lines to try and give you a, a psychological edge? Um... Not really, to be honest. You always targeted players more, got more technical probably because of maybe the, a skill set which was maybe a bit of a weakness. Um, and then you've maybe like the amount of players that are like, you know, single arm carriers with the, with the ball. Um, so like you target the, obviously the, 
you know, the single arm carriers and then get stuck in them saying, oh, you can't carry it in your right hand. Why you keep carrying it in your left hand? And, you know, I'm going to take it. It's like taking sweets off a baby and just that, that, that type of thing. But to be honest with you, I was very quiet on the pitch because I was always so fucked. <laughs> I was so knackered that I couldn't even open my mouth. Um, it was hands on the knees, sucking in as much oxygen as I could. Um, yeah, and, and just get on with my own job. I was, I was very, very quiet. Didn't really say too much to, to many people. and I didn't really give that much sledging back, actually, just because I wasn't trying to wind too many people up. But yeah, it was more, more just on a technical side of things, just getting into people. That, uh, technical. Uh, you telling me? You telling me that you boys never went into games trying to target someone physically? Uh, yeah, like I, I tried to target everybody physically. Yeah, um, but you would have had. You would have been like, listen, ten, right? Let's get you know a couple little late shots here and yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, I think the European Cup quarter final, uh, 2012 against Munster away. Um, we were seeded eighth, obviously a monster first, so we got the shit draw going to Thoman. Um, and like O'Connell was playing, David Wallace was playing, O'Gara was playing. Um, and I can remember back to one of my first games for Ulster, we were playing away to Monster, and like Ronan O'Gara, I come onto the pitch as like 100 kg dripping wet, uh, young fella, like, and he, and he grabbed me and he was telling me he was going to do F and S and F. And <laughs> <laughs> who the hell are you you think you're this you think you're the best player since sliced bread you're absolutely fucking shit and all this and like I can remember that in my head and like me and Rog get on like a house on fire he's an absolute legend of a bloke uh, obviously on the coach but uh, yeah that game I can remember getting stuck in the, the, the Rog because I think like we kept getting penalties at scrum time. A foal was doing a great job for us. Ryan Pienaar kept knocking him over from the halfway, knocking him over from the halfway. And you could see Rog getting agitated, getting, you know, the pressure was just starting to annoy him. So, uh, yeah, anytime I got the ball, I made sure I put the head down and ran, ran straight towards where Rog was, trying to get myself a few easy metres. Exactly. And Stevie, you're saying you didn't, on the field, you didn't tend to kind of, apart from that, those particular incidents no. tend to, uh, you know, give too, too much back. Talk us through, though, 2012, victim of a bite, English bad boy Dylan Hartley, who, who, who's denied on this podcast last year that uh, he couldn't actually remember your name. Uh, what, he, what He denied oh. he ever did it. Oh. That's he what. Denied, he denied he ever did it. Then why did he get banned? What was your, what's your recollection? I think he's a cheap shot merchant. So I always have done. Um, he's obviously a liar as well. So when we obviously played against England in 2012, bottom of a rock, far left-hand side. Like, I went to Dubai two day, three days after that. And a week later in Dubai, I still had the teeth marks of Dylan Hartley's teeth in my finger a week later. So, like, I'm hardly going to stand on the pitch and bite my own finger and go, hold on, ref. It's, you know, somebody, it was only me and Dylan Hartley on the floor. Like, it couldn't have been anybody else. Unless a dog fucking ran out from behind the stadium and bit me in the finger and then ran off again. So, like, see if he had, a, see if he had admitted it. See if he went, rang me up and I hear, see, sorry about that. Bit your finger. You know, as he talks about, what is it, the, uh, the red mess comes over him. Um, and I would have went, all right, no worries, pal. Like, we all make mistakes. See you later. Um, I'll catch you around. Like my pal of mine, Roger Wilson, played with him in Northampton and said, like he's a top lad, really good bloke. Um, I have I, I've sort of been in and around his company a few times, but uh, I've never got chatting to him. Um, That's what I was going to say. Do you never cross paths in the in this commentary world now and the sort of media world? No, I haven't actually. No, no, um, not at all actually. Uh, but. <sighs> I sat beside him actually, or not beside him, I sat beside Eddie Jones at a World Rugby Awards and it was in, another one that's usually in Monaco. Yeah. Well, I, I missed out on the one in Monaco and it was in London. <laughs> so <laughs> I, was sit, I was sitting at, uh, at a table with like a Toji and a, a lot of the other lads and Hartley was at my table. But like it was a huge big round table and like he was, was fucking flowers and vases and everything and he was the far side. And Eddie Jones was sitting right beside me. And like, I was like, what am I doing at this table? No, you just you walk up to the table and you sort of automatically look around to see who's going to be you know, sitting beside you. And I was all right. So all the other lads 
shook hands with me and said hello, apart from Dylan Hartley. So, like, he's obviously got a bit more beef with me than I do with him, but... Um, yeah. Maybe he's worried that you only had four fingers and he fought with you. <laughs> Stevie Four Fingers. That was me. Stevie Four Fingers. Stevie Four Fingers. Uh, but, yeah, like, I, I made a complaint to the referee straight away in match. Honestly, if that had happened in this day and age with all the camera angles and everything nowadays, like, you probably would have got banned for a couple of seasons, like, um, but that's what, that's the way it goes. Australia, mate. Yeah, Australian. I know. I'm completely literally. I'm like, because that's. I find that so in, like insightful. Getting, getting the, of, of course, getting the other side. And as you said, why would you bite your own finger? Yeah, why would um, bite your own finger? But like, uh, I sort of, like I completely, Mark. I completely forgotten about it until you sort of asked me there. <laughs> like, Sorry. And uh, yeah, like again, like what is it? Fucking ten years later, if he if he rang me up and went, look, let's put this to bed. I'm sorry, man. I bit your finger. I go, yeah, no worries, right? Sweet, that's it. Put the bed. I'll not speak about it ever again. But he has the audacity to call me a liar, like. Um, but yeah, sure, he got banned anyway. I think that tells its own story. Yeah, underline, double underline, exclamation mark. Uh, on that note, let's get predictions for the uh, England Australia game. Uh, Stephen, starting with you, mate. Yeah, I fancy England. Uh, again, I, I just think they're, uh, as the games go on here, um, they're looking a little bit better each time. So uh, I know Otoji's a big loss. Underhill, not so big, but still not great. But I just think, uh, yeah, England have got under the Aussie skins. And um, I'd like to see them get the result as well. I, you always like to see Northern Hemisphere rugby do well. You know, we come under so much criticism when we don't, don't do so well. So... It'd be great if Ireland get a result. Obviously, Wales and uh, and uh, you know England. So I'm going to go for an English victory. Um, I want I want to hear Max here because because <laughs> our predictions like really, really really aren't great. But are you still sticking with your guns good. down there? Are you still sticking with your guns? It's tough now. Max oh, predicted a three 0 whitewash by the Aussies. Yeah, but I didn't oh. say it was going to be like annihilation. Uh, they were going to be tight games. Yeah, but you said a 3-0 whitewash. I did say a 3-0 whitewash. Yeah. And Which so, true, and then last week you said definitely. So are you going to keep with it? Are you going to stick with the Aussies? Yeah, I'm going to stick with them. <laughs> by three, by three. Two, right, two. Right, Aussies. Three. Why? No, no, I just, I just feel it. Feel it in my yeah, bones. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm the same. I'm the same. I don't, I don't really think it should happen, but I sort of want to go with it. I quite like the Australian team. Um, and I reckon, where is it? It's in Sydney, is it? Oh, it's going to piss up for the England boys, though. They'll be down in the Coogee Pav straight after. But yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going. The Coogee Bay Hotel for, for a couple of jars. A few dark and stormies. A couple of schooners, mate. A couple of schooners. Schooners, mate, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm going to go. I'm going to stick with the Aussies. I'm going to back the Aussies again this week. Um, and I'm going to say by six. I reckon the Aussies will win by six. Fabs. Right, let's move on. Um, you boys doubled down last week. So can we have, please, another apology for our Welsh brethren? Yeah. Uh, uh, you, but, do, you, you do the apology this week because I did it last week. Just, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all, all the Welsh, women, Welsh women out there. But my bad, my bad. But that was a strange game. I thought... I mean, if someone's, yeah, if Andre slots a few more, I think, and there's that, that, that sort of offload into touch, there were a few opportunities where South Africa could have put that game to bed earlier, I think. Like, Wales, Wales left it late as well to get that fight back and get the victory. So, but yes, I apologise. Well, the Welsh were gutsy. Strange apology, Max. But no, I apologise, but, but Wales got lucky. Now, like, like Stephen was saying, it's genuinely though, how good is it to see the Welsh like going out and beating them? Like, I, I absolutely love that. I thought it was brilliant, especially after <laughs> not <laughs> just uh, not only us that wrote them off, Max. No. A lot of people wrote, wrote the Welsh off. Stephen, did you think they were going to beat South Africa in this tour? No, absolutely genuinely. not. Yeah, no. The media has made Welsh rugby look like an absolute farce, and they're. Alive and kicking, do you know what I mean? It's been, yeah. they've been, yeah, it's, it's mad. Mate, Dan Lydia, had like, fuck, he was so yeah. good. 
like the ultimate chopper, just yeah. slicing people in half, like just great for the shit. Player of the year stuff, yeah. Yeah, like like, again, how good to see him back and playing so well. Oh. Wait, wait, before we do predictions, Stephen, let's just, we're, we're playing devil's advocate. Uh, was there a touch of um, arrogance or was it the right call ultimately to go and make all of those changes ahead of that second test by South Africa from your point of view? Well, I did think it was going to be a lot closer um, because all those changes, like watch those guys week in, week out in, in the URC playing for the respective clubs. So um, I, I definitely thought there was a couple of points of weakness in, in that team, but like I thought wheels were, I totally agree with Max, but they're, just clung on and clung on, but they've been doing that for the last five seasons when everybody's been writing them off, yeah, um, including myself. So it wouldn't surprise me if they hung on again for large, large parts of this match on Saturday. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think the South Africans are firing that well at the minute. Um, yeah, chopping and changing your squad does it give the other lads a lot more time to get a bit more cohesion going into this week? I don't really know. Um, it's, it's it's going to be an interesting one, but I tell you what, the the Welsh lads will be very buoyant getting into this match, um, and there's nothing like a win to get your confidence up and and, and to shut a few people down as well. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it was a strange one making all those changes, Mark. But to be honest, I, I think it's good. You know, every international is an opportunity to blood new uh, new faces in and give more opportunity, and and it's only here in Ireland that we're Screaming the house down for Andy Farrell to to get you know give other lads a go and you know to see who's going to fill Johnny Sexton's boots next and to see who's going to come in and replace Robbie Henshaw if he goes down in the first match of the Rugby World Cup and and so forth. So like maybe it's they're not too fussed that they get beaten because they've been able to use that game as a brilliant opportunity to see a lot of these young young players and young talent. Did you boys see the obviously the Wynn Jones yellow card which everyone's been talking about? Hands in, never touched the ball. Um, but the more interesting part, I, I don't know that who was the nine playing for South Africa, the starting nine. Beyonce? Uh, no, that's the 13. No, that's the 13. Anyway, the starting nine for South Africa is uh, Sanjay <laughs> is, is getting off on his head and he's, he's giving him back a little <laughs> bit of that. Liam Williams. His nickname Sanjay, and you can see the nine mouths off to Liam Williams. Like, go on, what? And Liam Williams walks, storms towards him, and the little nine runs away, like properly runs in the opposite direction. <laughs> if you watch it back, it is absolute classic of a nine, like mouthing off, like, go on, get out of here. And the old scaffolder from Wales steams towards him, and he shits himself. But again, you see moments like that, and again, that could have ruined it, couldn't it? Because I don't think it was a yellow card. And you're like, this is this is it. The, the South Africans are going to pull it back here. But then only for Anskim to throw that ball over the top to Adams for that try. And then, obviously, put it out, you know, three points with that kick from the touchline. And am I right in saying he had a... He missed his child's birth being over there? Was that right? I think yeah, I saw something... Yeah, in, I saw, I that, yeah, I saw something in the press where he missed, missed his child's birth to be over there. And he said, but at least in 10 years' time, he'd be able to say to his little boy... Yeah, but look, this was what Dad was doing, beating the South Africans for the first time ever over there on their home soil. So here's the question. What country would be more angry at their team? The all black the New Zealanders or the South Africans? I think South Africa have got like an excuse though, don't they? Well, um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm not gonna say it. It, it wasn't an Irish team going over there, like that Irish team uh, yeah. Oh right, you're saying okay. You're saying well, Wales, Wales are bad. Let's compare. Whoa, no, I didn't. Is that, say that. Is that what you want to see? Still going, like, still going in there, guys. Great. Oh, no. <laughs> but like, you reckon the Sappers, the, you reckon the All Blacks, the Kiwis would be more angry at the the All Blacks for losing against Ireland over there. Yeah. yeah, it gets like it gets weird over there if you lose New Zealand. The press are absolute hounds. They just kill their players. Absolutely denigrate them. But yeah, I reckon it'd be way worse over there. But Steve's bang on. The, the the Welsh are a classic and just stand in touch, stand in touch, stand in touch and, and get winning the game. So fair play to them, boys. Fair play. Uh, you know, even at the win and the celebration at the final whistle, you could hear Adam Wynne Jones going in at the ref. Right? Raging. So have you ever had that, Ryan, where you've won a game but you still can't help 
just having to have a dig at something that's happened previously. Nah, not if you've won. I mean, sometimes when you've lost, you hear players like moan about it. But when you've won, just mate, relax. You know what I mean? Decision's done. Maybe it well, you know, it wasn't the other card, but they make mistakes, don't they? These refs. Right. We're gonna we're gonna give you boys a bit of a, a couple of seconds to think about it and think carefully about your predictions. So, Stephen, what are your thoughts on the final deciding test between South Africa and Wales? I'm going to go for a South African win. I have to go for I think they're going to bring their, their power game once more. Um, but, yeah, I think it's going to be tight. Like, uh, you know, seven, seven points a score. Uh, a little bit edgy towards the end. Um, yeah, <laughs> like, like, I had friends text me before the first test saying this is going to be a massacre. This is going to be 60 points. This is going to be this, that, and the other. And then, like, they just keep on doing it. And... You know, Pivac's come under. Wow, look at the pressure he's come under. Like he is, you know, he's getting a sack every week if if Wales lose. Like it's it's just it's insane. It's like he's a football manager or something. Like you know, a couple of bad losses and he's going to be out the gate. So yeah, I think you know the coaching staff, Stephen Jones, you know, Pivac, the rest of the lads, um, can hold their heads up high because you know going to South Africa, winning rugby World Cup champions, and getting one Test victory. I I think. You know, most Welsh fans would be pretty happy with that. Ryan? Oh, I, I would absolutely love to say Wales, but I think... Oh, I, I just... Um, you know, I think the South Africans are going to do it. And I think they're going to be... Again, it's going to be another thing where they're, they're angry. They're angry and you don't want to face an angry South African pack. So, um, I can see... I, I reckon it'll be a close game again. But I... I I'm sorry, but I think South Africa are going to win. And I wish I could say Wales. I wish I was saying Wales. And I probably should say Wales, but mm. I'm going South Africa. I'm going South Africa. You had three, three opportunities to do it over the last three yeah, years. Yeah, I but, know. Um, and even more so now. <laughs> Max. Max? I'm going to go with a, um, an 18 all draw, lads. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> so that you could give Wales. <laughs> That's very smart. Yeah, that's, I know. Hey, I know. I'm quite proud of myself. Call, by the way. That's a very good call. I don't think it's a bad call. I don't think it's oh. a bad call. Yeah. yeah, that's a bloody good bet. That. It, but obviously, we're not allowed to bet. Um, but that is a. Uh, ah, yeah. That's yeah. I, if I could, I've said it now. If I could, I'd change to that. That's smart. I like that. I like that a lot. All right. Perfect. Okay. Let's move on to Argentina, Scotland. The big one for you, Ryan. Um, Scotland levelling the series with a 29-6 victory against the Pumas. Four tries, not conceding any. That's a fabulous victory in the circumstances. Yeah, especially after last week, they've been pretty disappointed. But um, the first half was, again, another strange game, just quite boring. Um, But the boys pulled away in the second half. I think it was like 6-8 to Argentina, maybe the first half, in the first half. And then... Uh, the boys pulled away, like Mark Bennett playing well. Um, it's good to see him back in the Scotland shirt doing well. We've got so much, so much talent in the centres. Um, the young boy, Carl Rowe, um, old sevens boy, he's had a bit of a tough time with it. He managed to get his debut, so it's good to see him. But Hamish Watson on his 50th cap. How bloody good. Good to see me old mate Mish um, out there tearing it up. 50th cap, man of the match. He I heard was, he, uh, I heard he, he missed one tackle. I heard he missed the tackle. <laughs> yeah. He's broken it. First so, uh, miss in like how many years? And, and he literally got pulled up for it. It's quite funny. Yeah, but everyone's looking, aren't they? Everyone's watching and waiting. They're watching and they're waiting and they're hoping. And he'll have got some stick for it as well, which is ridiculous that you get stick for that, like having a run like that. But boys would have been cheering in the change room, like giving it. So, uh, but yeah, good on him. I was happy to see that. So the boys did well. That's the only test series that I'm still on course for getting correct, by the way, because I said 2 1, didn't I? To Scotland. Yeah, we've got all yeah. the others wrong, haven't we, Max? Yeah. No, I'm still on. I'm still in tope for my Ireland prediction. That's it. But yeah, I've got everything else wrong. I said two one to Ireland. Did you? I thought you said three now to Ireland. <laughs> no, no, no. I said two one. Uh, okay, okay. Sorry, but yeah, no, it was good. It was good. Did you watch that one, Max? Did you watch it, Steve? I did. I did watch it, man. That uh, Scottish back row is so good at the moment. Like enjoying it immensely. Like Dar just like continuing his form. Fakes and getting over the line, and obviously Mish is the man, and then the thunder and lightning duo of 
Van der Merth. I just wanted to just always get the ball. And Darcy Graham was, yeah, he looked very dangerous. And Bennett. But yeah, I thought Argentina though had, had some like a few couple of drops over the line as well. Like they yeah, had a, yeah, yeah. They had a few scoring opportunities, um, and they just a bit sloppy at the at the last hurdle. But um, yeah, Scotland looked pretty composed. They look, they look, they. You're right though. The second half was much more exciting. I bloody love Rory Dodge and Hamish Watson together in that yeah. back row. Two it's sevens. Awesome. It just works for me. It just works. It just fits. Ram, what's the story with Rory Dodge? Obviously, he's come on the scene like. He was with Edinburgh, correct? Yeah. And then moved over to Glasgow. But, like, he's, he reminds me of just, like, a, a smaller Hamish Watts. Or, like, a, you know, I think they're very similar in the way that they play. But he's a quality operator. What's the story with him at Glasgow? Yeah, well, exactly that. Like, they, he wasn't really playing over there. And I don't think they wanted him. So, Glasgow were like, yeah, sweet. We'll have you. So, thank you to them. And he just came on the scene. And, honestly, he's been outstanding. Like, tough bloke. Just humble young guy like real young and tough as nails and like you said even in his carrying for a small bloke my god yeah. he can break some tackles and he's got some unbelievable footwork on him as well and then once you get him in there like I know when I'm next to him in the defence line all I've got to do is try and just chop someone's ankles away because he's next to me and he's straight on the ball he's so strong on the ball but like you said they're very similar players Hamish is probably more of like a, a bump carrier whereas yeah. Darje uses his feet a bit more but those two together, oh, I love seeing them together in a, in a Scotland shirt. So, yeah, he's good. He'll be one. He'll, he'll definitely he'll uh, he'll get a lot of caps under his belt. I'll tell you that for sure. Quick prediction, Ryan, start us off. Scotland, Argentina, third test. Scotland will win by five points. Maxi, Scotland W. Yeah, Th- uh, eight points. Stephen, yeah, Scotland win. In between seven points. There we go. Uh, right. Quick fire for you, Stephen. First up, best player you've played against? Jerome Kino. Solid. Solid in, as an answer and as a human being, clearly. Uh, loosest teammate you've ever played with? I thought this was supposed to be quick fire. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Loosest teammate agreeing. you've ever played with? <laughs> <laughs> Say that again, sorry. Uh, loosest teammate you've ever played with? Uh, oh. There's been a few. Um, <laughs> um, the loosest, Andy Pyle. Okay, biggest fight you've ever witnessed in training? Uh, Paul O'Connell, Ryan Caldwell. Give us a quick one. Just, just what happened? Uh, I read Paul O'Connell's book to find out. It's, uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. But it, to be honest, it wasn't a fight. It was just one punch that sort of uh, just he knocked Caldy out, and yeah, and put him in hospital. So yeah, it was just watching it. Like as you know, lads, you kind of always see a bit of bump and a bit of argy bargy, and maybe a few punches thrown, but like. This was like in a boxing match where you see somebody getting knocked out. So it wasn't good to see. But yeah, I think it's in Paulie's book or a couple of different books. It's not on mine, which you can buy on Amazon if you want to have a look. But uh, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, that running on the ticket underneath. <laughs> yeah, um, so hold on. That, sorry, yeah. Stephen. I cut out for a second back there. What, who was it that punched who? Sorry, Paul O'Connell. On. Do you remember a guy called Ryan Caldwell? Yeah. Second row for he, he went and played. For Bath, and he had maybe uh, six months. Yeah, yeah. There. He's, he's a bit of a loose, loose as a goose, like that guy. So, um, yeah, he was did he deserve punch. it? No, he didn't deserve to get sparked out. No, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely sure. And worst enemy in rugby, Stephen? Uh, well, it seems to be Dylan Hartley. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should. I think we should kiss and make up. Yeah, that's the, this could be your olive branch. I'm sure he'll listen and he'll reach out after this. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, if the phone doesn't go, you come back on the show and have another, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have another sesh on it. No worries. Uh, if it wasn't for Dylan, someone else? Um, not really. I get on with everybody, generally, in rugby. Um, 
No, let's just say Dylan Hartley. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, three players in a cab with you for the ultimate piss up. Three players. Uh, Piley would definitely be one of them. Uh, a guy called Neil Best that used to play at Ulster. Oh, yeah. um, guy with the long black hair because he just used to. If you get into a fight, you'd want him in your on your side. Yeah. Um, and who else will I put in there? Sean O'Brien because he's a, he's a he's a good lad. Spent a lot of time with Shawnee over the years. Shared a lot of rooms with, with Shawnee. Um, yeah, he's he's good crack. Um, and yeah, he can drink long into the night. Fabulous. Well, I think we've just about run out of time, sadly. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. A huge thank you to Ryan and to Max and to Stephen. And we will see you all next week. Thank you.